Hello, Booktube. I had a particular errand that I had to run first thing this morning, and it brought me relatively close to the Brattle Bookshop in downtown Boston, a used bookstore that if, you're, if you've been watching this channel, you're well familiar with the Brattle Bookshop. If you're new to this channel, uh, it's a used bookstore in downtown Boston. I've been going there for well over two years. <laughs> and they, have, they have a huge sale lot next door to the store that has thousands of $1, $3, and $5 books, in addition to the, all the books that are inside the store. Uh, but I don't, I did, that didn't make my heart leap with joy, even though my errand was close to the Brattle, because I don't tend to go to the Brattle on the weekend, on Saturday. I don't tend to do that. And I don't tend to go to the Brattle late in the afternoon, and I don't tend to go in on the weekend because those times can be crowded. And I like to be the sole focus of the Brattle staff's attention <laughs> at all times. Uh, but I was right there, and the gravitational pull proved too much for me. So I wandered on over to the shop, even though it's a Saturday. And you're never going to guess what. I got a pile of books. <laughs> I got an absolute pile of books that I want to show you uh, and natter on about them. And the odd thing about this pile is how many mass market paperbacks there are. I, mass market paperbacks are, uh, in some ways, I'm sure that some of you out there, some of you readers out there will entirely agree with me, uh, in some ways they are a perfect piece of technology. Perfect pieces of technology are rare. Uh, a no-gear bicycle is a perfect piece of technology. Uh, a mass-market paperback is it, it, it is a, a marvelous thing. But like all books, like all print and paper books, it's frozen in its shape, like the victims of Medusa. <laughs> you can't increase the font size. You can't change the font, the type font. You, you can't. Uh, pinch and zoom on the screen. You can't. Uh, you can't increase the amount of light that's emitted by the screen by the pages because they don't emit any light at all. You need a light source to read a mass market paperback, and you need pretty good eyes. And they're fragile, whereas electronic books are not fragile. Uh, so, I, so I, there were a ton of mass markets that I saw, but I was I had a moment of hesitation where I thought, all right, well, you're seeing these things, but do you really want them? The simple truth is, though, that a lot of stuff that came out in the mass market boom in the second half of the 20th century, a lot of stuff that was published that way will never be an ebook, And it was never in hardcover. So if you don't round them up this way, you're never going to see them, I think. Maybe there are tranches of, of ebooks out there that will cover almost everything that you see here today. But I don't know. I don't know that that is true. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, so we have a lot of mass market paperbacks to go through. I'm trying to resist the allure of mass market paperbacks when you're worried about your overstock of books. The The allure of them is that they look tidy. So, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. So get 10 of them. Get 15 of them. Yeah. But they add up. They really do. They add up. So I was still trying to be choosy, but uh, I didn't do a very good job. So let's uh, let's look. we got a whole bunch of stuff to go through here. Mystery, science fiction, fantasy, juice, you name it. Even history. Uh, the first one we will do is a Timescape paperback. You old-time science fiction fans will smile when you hear that. It was an, it was an imprint of Pocket Books. And it said Timescape on the top. And that, it didn't always guarantee you a great book, but it guaranteed you something interesting. I remember when I was buying my science fiction paperbacks at a spinner rack at a dry goods store, and if I saw a new Timescape book, I grabbed it. I didn't care about the author. I didn't care about whether or not the description looked good. I didn't even read the description. I would just get it. I was seldom disappointed. And this, of course, I'm not going to be disappointed because I know this book really well. This is Alfred Bester, who will be familiar to casual fans of science fiction from his great novel, The Demolished Man, and his almost great novel, The Star is My Destination. But he wrote lots of other stuff, too. Some of his short fiction is great, and he also wrote, I am a fan of of a couple of his later novels. Two in particular. And this is one of them. Gollum Raised to the Hundredth Power. How wonderful to find you know, a perfect condition mass market paperback of this. I had a hardcover of this thing once upon a time. Don't know that it even exists as an ebook. And this is going to be a pattern that crops up because this is a heavily illustrated mass market paperback. And it's not the only one by a long shot that I got today. I was not looking uh, this is also weirdly illustrated because this is this is Bester 
just indulging in weirdness. <laughs> he indulges in weirdness in this book. I think that it pays off in the end. This book has an unbelievably psychedelic ending. It's going to be a pleasure to read this again. I haven't read it in years. Uh, but it's not the only illustrated mass market paperback that I got today. I got a lot of them completely by accident. Uh, then this next one, this is a signet mass market paperback of a book that I like. I don't love it like Michael K. Vaughn does, but I like it. And it has had so many editions. Oh, my God. Lovely trade paperbacks. Uh, the Folio Society edition of this is unbelievably good. But I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted, and I didn't think I would ever find it. Once upon a time, eons ago, uh, in 1963, uh, no, 1964, eons ago, I saw a particular mass market edition of The Planet of the Apes by Pierre Boulle. And I fell in love with it. I got it uh, on the spinner rack, and I read it. I fell in love with it, and then I got rid of it. Probably a dog ate it or something like that. And all through the decades since then, Every time I've seen a Planet of the Apes, a version of Planet of the Apes, a paperback, a trade paperback, a hardcover, a gift edition, I have turned them down. It is, it is silly, quixotic desire to recover that volume. I have found it today. I actually found it today. That is the cover of the Planet of the Apes that I have always wanted. I finally have this. Great. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Uh, then we have something... Uh, this is an author that I have read, uh, but I haven't read him working under this name. The name here is Roland Green, but I have read this author. He did a long series of portal fantasy stories called the Blade novels, Richard Blade novels, in which the, the schlubby hero goes to an alien world and he loses his clothes and picks up 60 pounds of upper body muscle. <laughs> so he's, he's buck naked on like 30 Blade covers. But I read a couple of Blade novels for, of course, Garbagas. <laughs> I will probably read a couple more for this coming Garbagas. Uh, but the, I found a Roland Green novel. I looked around. I did not. This is a sequel to, uh, this is a sequel to Wandor's Journey. This is Wandor's Voyage. I think... If I remember correctly, Wandor's Journey was Roland Green's first published novel. And this is a sequel to that. I'm thinking that there isn't a whole lot of intellectual heavy lifting involved here. I should be able to come in on the sequel. I looked for Wandor's Journey and did not find it today. Probably it was there. There were a lot of mass market pay racks there, but I didn't I didn't find it. And, I, and uh, so this is just going to have to do. I thought the cover was hilarious because he... It looks like he and his lady friend are not very popular. <laughs> so there'll be a little bit high fantasy, considering what it looks like and considering what else this guy has written. This will probably be a Garbagas pick, I'm thinking. Uh, then uh, I found four things, and I think I have one of these, but I grabbed all four because I couldn't remember off the top of my head. I didn't want to leave any behind. The author is Dale Van Every, who I really, really like. He is a really good writer. He's totally forgotten now. And that's a shame. He might be remembered in cinematic circles, but he's totally forgotten as a writer. And that's too bad. Uh, he wrote a lot of nonfiction that was really good, including a book called Disinherited about the United States treatment of Native Americans, of First Nation peoples, that is one of the best books on the subject, That one of the only books I know that is fit to say on the same shelf with Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee or Custer Died for Your Sins, one of the only books that's that good on the subject. I looked... For a copy of Disinherited. <laughs> I very much would like a copy of Disinherited. Didn't find it. But I found a bunch of his fiction, all of which is going to work for June on the Range. Uh, I found uh, The Voyagers with a naked couple cavorting in the swamp. You're really not going to have to worry about marauding Mohawks there. You're going to have to worry about leeches and snakes, believe you me. They're going to get to you long before the Mohawks do. Then I found The Shining Mountains. Some of these... Uh, Dale Van Every novels, I'm sure that I bought at the time and read. And this one creaks a little. I don't know that this is going to, I don't know. I, after, after my experience with The Hound of the Baskervilles in the Magnum Easy Eye edition for my read of Hound of the Baskervilles, I now expect all of these paperbacks to blow apart on me. I don't expect, they'll, they'll die in the hands of an active, caring reader who is lovingly reading them. If any book, no book has a higher desire than to die that way. <laughs> Believe you me, when you spend $175, $275, $375 on a Folio Society edition in mint condition 
and you immediately reverently take it out of the package and put it on a shelf with all the other folios behind a cabinet door that locks so the kids can't get at it. That book is crying, and so are all the other books next to it. Uh, books want to be read. And so these mass market paper wrecks, if I destroy them all, I destroy them all. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, then I also found uh, Westward the River. Uh, once again, I want to point out that, you know, if you're in a bog, first of all, you want a shirt on because you're going to get eaten alive by mosquitoes. And second, you don't want to be wearing a ball gown. <laughs> right inside. These people are making their own problems. <laughs> and then the Scarlet Feather, which I'm pretty sure I have a copy of. Only at the Brattle could you find two copies of this thing in the course of one year. I'm pretty sure that I have a copy of this and may have looked it over for June on the Range. I will read it again, though, uh, with a terrific cover there. Just, just wonderful. It really tells a story. Uh, then more science fiction, and not only more science fiction, but more illustrated science fiction. I've mentioned on this channel a few times that for a little while there, there was a vogue of having artwork all over the inside of a science fiction novel. And I just happened to find a few, a few examples of that. This one is by Roger Zelazny and Fred Saberhagen, and it's called Coils. And not only is it, uh, yeah, there we go, see, the, not only is it illustrated all throughout, uh, but it has a fully painted Howard Chaikin cover. So you, you might look at this and say, the, you know, you've got two legends teaming up there, but really you've got three. This is Roger Zelazny, Fred Saberhagen, and Howard Chaikin uh, all teaming up on one book that would have cost you a grand total of $2.95. I'm sure that I got this when it when it came out. This came out in the 70s, is that right? 1982. I'm sure that I got this when it came out. I'm sure that I did. I was a big Howard Chaikin fan. Uh, and I'm a, I was a, I'm a big Roger Zelazny fan. I have my problems with him. Uh, but I'm, I'm a big fan of his. Fred Sabering never really did it for me, but uh, I'm sure that I got this then. I'm sure that I haven't read it since then. So I, I grabbed it today. Then we have... Uh, I, I had to get I had to get something for for mystery and mayhem for Jim's channel. I had to do that. I saw this and just couldn't resist. I guess this could be from March Mystery Madness. I'm pretty sure that it could. This is I the Jury by Mickey Spillane. <laughs> with this, with, this is the 40th anniversary paperback, and so they reprinted the original some very vintage cover artwork for I the Jury. Uh, that I guess gives Mickey Spillane as fans of the Mick can can have a little nostalgic thrill with this cover. I would not have done that because it's not a very good cover. Uh, because the gunman is pointed at her toaster off in the kitchen. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not as thrilling as I think the artist might think. But I haven't read a Mickey Spillane novel in forever. So so I will I will gladly uh, see what this one has to offer. I have read, I know that I've read I the Jury. I know that I have. But I, it's not like you remember details from a Mickey Spillane novel. Uh, then this next one, I know nothing about this author. I suspect this is a pen name. Uh, this is The Spearman of Arn by an author named Del Dowdell. I have never seen this before. I don't think my eyes have ever set foot on this particular fantasy novel. I think it's a, uh, a switched body novel. Uh, he hitched a ride on a routine flight over the Bermuda Triangle, but there was nothing routine about the eerie hole in the sky which threw them through which they flew. Then they were attacked by giant birds, and if they didn't prove it, the twin sons did, and this was not Earth. The lone survivor, he was found and expected to be Tygen, the legendary warrior who would free the people of Arn from the Thelonese. They were his deadly enemies, but they were the only ones who could help him get home. Okay, are we talking 1970s here? Uh, 1978, I don't think I've ever heard of this thing, so I'm gladly I will I will try it. There is no uh, there's there's February fantasy stories. It seems largely abandoned in the cradle, and as, aside from that, there is no, as far as I know, no big, huge, gigantically popular, Garbogus style, March Mystery Madness style, huge institutional booktube event for fantasy. And, despite New World's November being out there, nothing of the same scope for science fiction either. So, I will read the first chapter of this thing, and after the first chapter, as I suspect, I might decide that it'll work just fine for Garbogus. <laughs> I think that it probably will. Uh, then we have uh, two, one volume with two short novels in it by Robert Silverberg. 
I don't think I've ever read either one of the books in this thing. This is Conquerors from the Darkness and the Master of Life and Death. There, this guy has just beheaded a green scaly creature. That's a pretty good... Is that a an Annie Leibovitz cover? That's an Annie Leibovitz cover, I think. Pretty sure. Who else could it be? Uh, this this Silverberg's been writing forever. I, he's the one the one exception to my ongoing joke that every author that I hold up on this channel is dead because Silverberg is two hundred years old and he's still alive. Uh, but I, any any Robert Silverberg I can get, I looked around for some others. There's some science fiction. There's some Robert Silverberg mass market paperbacks that I would like to find. Didn't see any others. Uh, this time around. Who knows what the next one will be. Then we have a historical novelist who has fallen out of the public consciousness. He once once was big. Once upon a time, he was big. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> he's, he's out of print. He's forgotten. Uh, but I've read, I read his most famous book and thought it was pretty good. Good swashbuckling adventure. I could swear I've read one other book of his that I cannot... I cannot figure out if he was the author. The author is Edison Marshall. And I found a book of his today called Caravan to Xanadu, which is about Marco Polo. That, that guy on the cover is supposed to be Marco Polo. A novel about Marco Polo. I have a sweet spot for those. I have a sweet spot for Marco Polo just in general. I think he's an utterly fascinating author, fascinating figure. At the beginning of this book, the Doge of Venice calls him to an audience, says, I read your book. And I just wish that you had taken me along on your adventures. And Marco Polo has no idea what he's talking about and thinks he might be in trouble. And the doge goes on and on and says, I just wish that I'd been there. I wish that we'd shared those perils together. And then he gets around to making his point, which is that those kinds of sweating bullets, I don't know if we're going to make it through this, love and lust and danger and excitement elements are missing from Marco Polo's book. And the, the conceit here, I think, is that this book is supposed to be the book he would have written in a more human vein. It doesn't matter to me. I am totally up for it. Absolutely, totally up for it. This has been loved. As you can see, it, there's some cocking going on there. And it's also it's also not strong. And it's big. It's, it's uh, 400 pages long. So I might not, uh, I might destroy this thing. That, that I could easily see that happening. It's also got footnotes at the back, endnotes at the back of the book. The one thing it doesn't have is an exhaustive list of what uh, of what Edison Marshall has done. It lists only three books. Uh, American Captain, The Infinite Woman, and uh, what I think is his most famous book, Yankee Pasha, which was made into a movie, and I thought the novel was terrific. I, I, it's just a, a wonderful swashbuckling adventure. But I could have sworn that he also wrote a novel about Pompey the Great. Doesn't seem it. Doesn't seem like the kind of subject that would that would that would tempt him. But I don't know. It doesn't matter. I I this thing I'm, I was never going to see it again, so I grabbed it. Then I found a trilogy of science fiction by an author who's probably not known as a science fiction author. I saw this trilogy inside the shop forever and ever. I don't know if this is the same trilogy, but the ones inside the shop were four dollars a piece, and I wasn't going to do that for mass market paperbacks. But for a dollar a piece, where I'm not paying four dollars for all three of them. This is a science fiction trilogy by Eric von Lustbader, who your grandparents probably knew for a book called Ninja. But he did science fiction, and this is really good. This What is the name of this? The Sunset Warrior trilogy. We have uh, the Sunset Warrior. Look at that artwork. Just amazing. Who is that? Is that Frazetta? I think that's Frazetta. These take place in a weird, uh, well-imagined uh, future. There's Sunset Warrior. There's sail sailing shallows of the night, and there's Dyson. And these are terrific, just terrific. When did these? Dare I want? Do I want to know? When did these come out? Uh, uh, Double Day is that what you are? Double Day Fantasy. This this came out in uh, well the 1980s, the early 1980s. Uh, and the the uh, they're very strange. They're there's lots of combat. There's lots of uh, action. There are scenes in here that I remember, even though I haven't read them in forty years. I haven't read them since they first came out in this pap paperback run. But now I finally have these again. Perfect example of the sort of thing that just will not exist as an ebook, and that's never going to be reprinted in any other way. It's not like anybody's going to come out with a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition of the Sunset Warrior trilogy, and yet it's really good. It's well worth a read. Uh, then we have two books each from two other science fiction figures. And the first one, 
both of these science fiction figures are really nice guys. But the first one I'm going to mention, uh, you're not really going to believe that. <laughs> it's, it's a, the first author that I want to mention is Jerry Pornell. If you don't know anything about Jerry Pornell and you decide to look him up, I, a glance at his science fiction encyclopedia entry, a glance probably at his Wikipedia entry, just a glance at those entries, if you don't know anything about Jerry Pornell, is going to have you saying, oh, so this guy was like a monster. <laughs> He's like one of the worst people in the world, not only for his opinions, but also for his actions. It, he, he, so he was really, really awful then. And I'm here, I'm here to tell you, don't have to believe me, but he wasn't. Despite everything, despite all that he believed, despite all that he didn't believe, despite all that he advocated, despite all that he didn't advocate, he was a really nice guy. <laughs> and I haven't read his science fiction in forever. So I found another illustrated uh, paperback of Janissaries, a very popular novel of his. Uh, th this has tons of illustrations all throughout. Jerry Pornell really liked to write about uh, science and also the military. His military science fiction is really, really good. I think this might be the same artist who illustrated uh, at least one Dorsai volume. Uh, but there, there's something sweet about having illustrations all throughout a science fiction novel. Look at this cover, too. Just amazingly good. Very, very 70s. Very late 70s. Uh, is that right? Yeah, 1979. Uh, and this is, uh, let's see here. Surrounded by Cuban advisors and Nationalist Front native Marxists, they knew that if they fought, they, if they fought on, they would be annihilated. If they surrendered, there would be a show trial first, but death lay at the end of that road too. There was, however, a third alternative. Thus begins a spectacular novel of high adventure, the newest and best work yet by co-author of the national bestseller Lucifer's Hammer. If you know Jerry Pornell, if you're a casual reader of science fiction. You might know Jerry Pernell because he teamed up with Larry Niven on Lucifer's Hammer and a couple of other things that did really well. They they actually went where Jerry Pornell himself never went, which was to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, but I'm going to give him another try. I found Janissaries, and I also found The Mercenary. I didn't find any others. I was looking for West of Honor, and I didn't find that. Uh, but look at look at this cover. That's a Boris Vallejo cover. How amazing. <laughs> How amazing. I seem to remember... This is this is pocketbooks. I seem to remember that there was a later printer of the Mercenary that was a Timescape book. It had Timescape there. I'll have to ask Mark Richardson or any of the other science fiction experts that are now that are swarming around BookTube. We don't have it to ourselves anymore. Uh, but I'm I'm going to give Jerry Pernell's two of these books a try. I didn't see any of them, so I just grabbed these. It's not going to be complete at all. Uh, although, if if Ollie at Criminali can decide that he's going to read everything ever written by Evan Hunter, the author who became famous as Ed McBain, uh, even though that will consist of 500 books, 450 of which will be absolute garbage, then surely I can embark on a project to read everything written by this next author, Alan Dean Foster. <laughs> Is it even thinkable that one person could read everything by Alan Dean Foster? I found I'm not always fond of Alan Dean Foster, I should say, as a person, yes. But as an author, no. Uh, not always. Some of it is just phoned in. Although I think he maintains a remarkably high level of sentence-by-sentence -sentence quality. Uh, and maybe Collie would say the same thing about Evan Hunter, and maybe it's true about Evan Hunter. I don't know. Some of the, the 87 Prethinks novels that I've read, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, one of the things I love that Alan Dean Foster did, and certainly I'm not alone here, are his uh, Flinks and Pip novels. Uh about a young boy and his mini dragon, his incredibly powerful mini dragon, and the adventures that they have. They struck a chord with Foster's readers. Foster's readers liked them, wanted more of their stories. And I found two of those. Uh, Blood Hype, with that, these, these great Frazetta covers. I found Blood Hype and Orphan Star. And I, I, I want both of these things. A dollar was just the right price, so I got them. Um, then I mentioned that the, we're almost out of mass markets here. I mentioned that in the mass markets I found uh, history as well. I found two volumes in the Pelican History of England. Multi-volume set, all, all by different authors from different periods in English history. You don't usually go to these things for cutting-edge uh, archaeological or historical analysis. You go to it because the authors of books in these series got the brief, and it was, you know, uh, back in back in what the 1960s, the 1970s. 
you might know somebody or somebody might know somebody and eventually it gets around, you know, would you like the brief for the, the volume covering the Renaissance? It's 500 pounds. And you do it, but you're not expecting that your readers are going to expect that you're doing any kind of scholarly monograph, anything that anyone's going to use as a reference at all. And that can often lead writers in this in series like this. There were a couple for uh, American presidents. There were a couple for English monarchs. They, 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 keep, they come and go. Uh, right now, the most popular one is the very short introduction series from Oxford. Uh, when an author knows that, that this, this, this isn't going to be peer-reviewed, specialists in the genre are not going to expect that you are error-free and uniquely penetrating. When the author knows that, they can, it can often free them to free associate about the period, to think in often very erudite terms about the period. And I love that. I absolutely love that. Uh, so I got a couple of volumes here. I got one on the beginnings of English society uh, by Dorothy Whitelock. This will be about the age of Beowulf. This will be about uh, uh, the, the ancient times before before the waves of, of major invasion. And I also found I.A. Richmond's book on Roman Britain. Now, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, where you cannot expect given how much has been written about Roman Britain, you can't expect this to be your Bible in terms of facts and figures and the latest interpretation of archaeological finds. But its I remember both of these volumes. They're extremely engagingly written. So I got both of them. <laughs> Even though I don't need them, I got both of them. And that is all the mass market paperbacks. We have a few more books to go. I found a UK trade paperback of a book that I really like. I think I have it as an ebook. I had it as a finished copy from an, its American publisher, but I don't have it at all. As a book anymore, I don't have it at all. I have it as a file, but not as a print and paper book. Uh, and it's Dermot McCullough, who I absolutely love. This is his book on the Reformation. And there you have major players in the Reformation, <laughs> some of them anyway, which is pretty interesting. This, uh, These UK trade paperbacks are by Penguin, uh, and I, I'm definitely going to want this. The problem here... <laughs> okay, I, I opened it to uh, a figure carved into a chancel arch of a butt. <laughs> so I'm wait, waiting to be chastised. This probably will also fall apart on me, as delicate as I will be with it. And also, you know, it's got tiny print and you can't do anything about the print. With these primitive paper and paste books, you can't do anything about the print or about anything else. But... I'm glad I have it. I will read it until it falls apart. Definitely. Uh, this is this is a, a huge huge elaboration on the Reformation chapters in Dearman McCullough's magisterial gigantic history of Christianity. This is a it well deserves to have a volume of its own. So very was happy to find it. I've had this volume before. It always falls apart on me. Uh, this next one is also something that I've had before. I this came out in nineteen in two thousand fifteen. So almost ten years ago. Uh, and I loved it. I wrote about it. If I remember, I will try to leave a link to my review down below. This is by Nancy Marie Brown, and it is called Ivory Vikings. And it's about this famous chess set, it, where she she uncovers as much of about this famous chess set as can possibly be known. I saw that as the description of this thing, and I thought, okay, well, that's a non-starter. That was an article for History Today. That's not a book. And I was very pleasantly surprised. That at how how effortlessly full this thing is, I reviewed this. I'm pretty sure for the Boston Globe. I think, uh, but it, I really liked it. It was a, it was a pleasure to review it, and it, I haven't seen it since. I got the the uh, you know this is this is the advanced copy, the review copy. I got the review copy, then I got the finished copy. I got rid of both of them, and I've never seen it in the wild since then. So I was happy to find it today for I think a dollar. Uh, so I will definitely give it a reread. It's one of those books that you get. I get tons of books in the mail. I know. I know. I get tons of books in the mail. And yet I went to the Brattle and got a 30 books. <laughs> I get tons of books in the mail. I in no way need more books. But I went and got them anyway, including doubles. Uh, including this next one, which is a double. I had this once upon a time. The minute I saw it at the shop today... I questioned whether or not I still have it and what shape my original copy is in, if I do have one. Uh, it's a tiny little thing from Samuel Elliott Morrison, who's my favorite American historian. He wrote a thing called Spring Tides, which is just nautical memories. That's all. It's a tiny little thing. 
uh, nautical memories, nautical reflections, his life. It's a, dar it's a darling little book, a wonderful thing to revisit. And this is a perfectly fine hardcover with a plastic covering on it. I, I don't know. I don't know if my, the copy, the last copy that I had, which I'm sure I held on this channel, I'm not sure if that last copy is holding together at all or, or well. But it, it certainly isn't brand new like this. So, you know, for another dollar, I grabbed it. And then the last thing here, egregious. I do not need to do this at all. I get stacks of books in the mail. I do not need to do this at all. And yet, if I do this, well, okay. Uh, Edison Marshall in a mass market payback, sure. Because I'm not going to see that anywhere else. No one's ever going to reprint it again. It's not an ebook, as far as I know. So, sure. Okay. But this last one, not only do I already have a paper copy of it, and not only do I have an e-copy of it, but this particular copy is marked. It's not marked on the inside, but still. This is Post-War by Tony Jude. This is a great book. Uh, this is the, the classic American penguin, the orange spine thing there. This is a great study of post-war Europe. It is erudite. It is surprisingly witty. It's all-knowing. It's incredibly wise. This is this is a great work of uh, of nonfiction. Far far more than just a history book. Uh, so I was happy to see it for a dollar. I grabbed it for a dollar, but why? Especially when uh, Ben has made it known that this is his copy. <laughs> so I'm going to see. Well, I'm going to get clever when I get a chance. I'm going to get clever and see what I can do about Ben's name. I don't think there's any way that I can transform that into Steve. I don't think there is a way that I can do that. But I'll give it a try. It's possible. I'll give it a try. Uh, but but I, had, I had to grab it because I don't have this trade paperback. I have a UK trade paperback of it, uh, and I have an e-book of it. And, uh, but I don't have this, so I, I, I grabbed it. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But it was fun to visit the shop. Uh, it, it was it was it was fun to see everybody and and look around and learn all the latest the latest uh, shop gossip about what's. Uh, I also had a book to drop off to the shop, and it was fun to browse around in the sale lot, even though there were lots of people making dumb commentary. Problem with lots of I don't have a problem with lots of people at the Brattle. I want them to thrive, of course I do, but the weekend brings out morons. The weekend brings out people who are vacationing at the hotels that are lining the common, and they find this cute little bookstore. And oh, isn't this you like to read books, don't you? And you can't, I can't do this. You know, if I do that, it's going to be obvious that I hate their guts. So I just have to sit there and listen while they misattribute names or titles where or you get the pretentious people who say, oh, books, oh, I love, read them all. I haven't read a book in 20 years. I just, I, I put on my big boy pants and just turned a deaf ear to as much of it as I could and had a blast. Uh, the only drawback uh, is the one you can see coming, which is that the baby bean did not like me being away. She did not like that at all. But I'm not going to leave her for a long time. So I, I will be fine. She'll be just fine. So, so there you go. No sense in trying a Steve pyramid here because the mass market paper racks would destroy me. <laughs> they would destroy us all. I got, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I got 21 mass market paper racks. Uh, so I'm not going to do a Steve pyramid. <laughs> but it was a fun trip. Uh, it, it, it makes me think about why I would get a mass market now. Why would I do that? Uh, I wouldn't get a mass market of, uh, there are a whole bunch of things that I passed up today. I saw some Judge D mysteries. I saw a couple of Elizabeth George mysteries that, sure, March Mystery Madness is right around the corner, but I would never do that. I have those as eBooks, and that's all they need to be. Uh, some of the others, I saw some a lot of Deathland books by Axler, but I have those as eBooks, so and I don't want them. I don't want them except for Garbagas. So I'm pretty happy with my choices today, uh, as any addict would say. <laughs> but I, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.